Well, thank you very much to all of you. There was so much to think about there. I want to begin by actually picking up that last point that Tony made, if I may, with you, Fahana. You're in a hurry. The, the, the motion says it all. We're talking about climate collapse. Why worry about overturning the system? Why not work with what you've got? Because we've been trying for 30 years to have legally binding targets and caps, and they haven't happened. So it's not like we've not, not thought about any of these things. You know, we've got to the point of rebellion because we've understood that the system cannot create the solutions that are necessary for its own transformation. In a more sort of elegant way, Audre Lorde, who is a, a feminist poet, thinker, strategist, um, you know, says, said it very nicely, actually. She said, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us to temporarily beat him as his own game, but they will never enable us to buy genuine change. That's my insight from the last 30 years. We've been banging our heads trying to do exactly these things. And the very industries, the very countries that are dependent then on these industries, because entire countries are then dependent on some of the largest industries, are not making the change. I did want to add one more very large subsidy, which is the military. So fossil fuel you know, takes place now largely in hugely authoritarian regimes. The destruction of nature is backed by a fist of force. Nature defenders are being killed, and those regimes are held together. That is an additional cost okay. in the system, and we don't talk about it, and it requires radical change. But Ertana, you were a regulator in various different guises. Why are we still having this conversation now if it was possible to drive through the kind of change that, that Tony was talking about? Well, because we didn't win the argument, but we've got to win the argument. But I think the challenge for George and for Hana is they say, we failed to win these arguments in the past. Lobbying and the power of money has prevented having tight enough a, 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 you know, rules and regulations. So we're going to abolish capitalism but you're going to have to win the argument for abolishing capitalism. Why is it going to be easier to win the argument for abolishing capitalism than to win the argument for regulating capitalism? The point is we've got to win the argument. And once we've won the argument and got the legally binding targets that Tony talks about, we will then find that having a marketplace which helps you work out the details of it will be better than having public ownership of the means of production and distribution and exchange. Because I do think it is incumbent on Fahana and George to say what the alternative is. So it's very easy to say, we hate capitalism, it's not going to work. The alternative is public ownership of the means of production and distribution and exchange. And we know that when that was applied in Eastern Europe and Russia, the environmental impacts of that were far, far worse George, than the impacts of capitalism. George, you began to talk about a possible alternative. Do you want to expand on this private sufficiency, public luxury? Yes, so, so the principle of it is it's not state control. I'm not a communist. You know, there's this assumption that if you're against capitalism, you have to be a, communism, as if there, a, a communist, as if there's only two options in this fascinating and complex world. But the, the, the massively neglected sphere of the economy and the one which delivers both equity and environmental protection is the one that no one ever talks about, which is the commons. We discuss this as if there's only two kinds of economy. There's the market and there's the state. But actually, the commons, which is, used to be huge, is huge in some people's lives, is a bit where we control what goes on around us. Neither the state does it, neither the market does it. We can control public services, we can control land. Um, we, the local communities, are able then to exercise far more power in decision-making than we can under either of those other systems either capitalism or communism. Both take power away from us. I'm all for taking back control, but not in the way that Dominic Cummings means. <laughs> Tony Juniper, come on, what's, what's wrong with that kind of regulation? Well, it's not regulation, it's real people running their own lives and making their own decisions. I've spent much of my career trying to correct a phenomenon called the tragedy of the commons, uh, whereby leaving people to have their own uh, agenda in terms of how they manage natural resources leads to them being trashed. 
whether that's the logging of forests, the exploitation of fish stocks, or in this country, the trashing of the uplands by sheep grazers who have commoners' rights. So it's not necessarily a solution to this particular set of challenges. It can go badly wrong if it's not regulated, if it's not under some kind of legal control based upon some kind of ecological outcome that all of society subscribes to. I would say that we're far better to have the imposition by governments of legally binding caps on emissions and on the recovery of nature and to use a variety of tools to be able to achieve those ends, including some of those tools which are at the center of the capitalist system. I'm not against people having common rights, but I just don't see that that would be a solution George, that would replace capitalism. George the Bombier. tragedy of the commons is a completely discredited notion. Yeah. I mean, it's been totally well, destroyed and ripped down. Well, and what Garrett Hardin, who, who um, proposed that idea, did was to confuse an open access regime with a genuine commons, where there is control, there is regulation by the people. The fundamental thing that both Tony and Adair are fighting against all the time, the question why this hasn't happened already, despite decades and decades of yeah. efforts, okay. is that capitalism not only is an economic system, it becomes a political system as well. It empowers those, politically, it empowers people who yeah. gain the fruits of capitalism, okay, and yeah. they prevent this change from taking place. That's so why we're in the they, fix. Are they preventing it in Finland? So, sorry, can well, I... Are they preventing it in... Uh -huh. Finland is a okay. capitalist economy. Yeah. Is a capitalist economy with a social democratic government now committed to zero carbons by 2035. Why isn't that an attractive capitalist Fana. model? Well, so we can... You know, there are many types of capitalism. It's not one thing or another. There are slightly better versions out there. And I think the issue is that even the slightly better versions cannot really get to grips with the scale and rapidity with which we need to change. They're all locked in now. They can't do it. Even ni nice, nice Norway. Let's look at nice Norway. You know, nice Norway just had a legal ruling which said which was, you know, t they were taken to court by the domestic NGOs for more drilling in the Arctic. More drilling in the Arctic. Nice Norway here. Saying, you know, we're the better drillers because we have higher standards than those baddie ones, you know, out in Venezuela. They are still drilling. They're still drilling. Like the, one of the richest countries in the world. Another example that I would well, love you to look up. The Amazonian, Amazon Sacred Headwaters an area larger than the size of the UK with a little bit of Wales you know, added, a huge area, huge area. Three different countries own it, Peru, Ecuador, Brazil. This area is pristine and is home to indigenous people, many millions of them who have lived there in harmony, looked after their forest, and now it's being opened up to drilling and oil. Okay. You tell me how I you fix that system now, because that, that entire area is about to go. Adair, I'm and this is what we're briefly. talking about. There is no way to stop capitalism from doing that, I'm because it's come back always briefly, more Adair, valuable to and rip then we're it out. Go to the floor. Well, I mean, Fahana, you said it. There are many different forms of capitalism. And capitalism can have new deals. Capitalism can have new ways of doing it, which can involve significant roles for the state alongside the private sector. You use this term New Deal. We all use the term New Deal. The New Deal was a phrase of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who I think was the greatest American president of the last century. Franklin Delano Roosevelt did not say he was anti-capitalist. Indeed, what he introduced by his policies was the absolute glory days of capitalism, where it delivered what capitalism can deliver more effectively than ever before. And we can win these arguments, and we have to, because the alternative, if you simply come forward in the political process and say we're going to reject capitalism, frankly, I think it will make it less likely that we will get the tough measures required to drive the change we needed. Indeed. Yeah. Well, we're going we're gonna, to... There's so much to talk about. I, everyone's bursting to talk. Uh, we're going to open the debate up to all of you. Before we do that, I just want to reveal the results of the pre-vote. <laughs> That's how you voted when you came in. So 38% of you are for the motion to stop climate collapse, we must end capitalism. 28% are against, and 34% are undecided. So you're the ones that uh, the panel has to persuade that we all have to watch. So we'll go to the floor. This is your chance to take part. Hello. Um, my question uh, really relates to some of the examples that have been given of the countries, whether it's Finland or Norway, 
I mean, frankly, in the great scheme of things, rather small in terms of population. Yeah. If we look at the very large populous economies of Asia, of India, and of Africa, and ask the questions of how you end capitalism or end consumerism in those societies. Some are democratic, some are not democratic. That just doesn't seem to be addressed. We also have the other major economy of the United States, which seems to have gone off on a sort of private and rather peculiar mission of its own. Okay. <laughs> Let's have the second question, number two over there. So I'm not <coughs> sure, entirely sure that I agree with either side of this question, but most of this is, is directed towards the, the pro side of the question. I mean, just, as it was, was sort of brought out, I mean, just, uh, that a reasonable estimate of what fossil fuels are subsidized for is 5.6 trillion. I mean, just, I've seen that. And it was also sort of brought out that the cost of renewable energy has dropped enormously. And in yep. fact, I mean, just, I think that the most reasonable conclusion is that renewable energy now is less expensive than fossil energy. So given those two things, I mean, just, uh, that is this really a political question in the sense of just convincing people to withdraw these subsidies that, and remove the, the restraints on allowing renewable energy to come forward? Or is it an economic question where you need to in, you know, overturn the entire system. So I would think that, that it really comes down to something that's very simple. Just you, you get out of the way, I mean, just to, and the problem solves itself. Okay, thank you. And number three over there. So I had a question to both sides, which was um, the pro side said that uh, if we include, continue with economic growth in order to put, let people out of poverty, we're going to go straight into, uh, that's going to hugely overshoot the planetary um, our resources and our environmental boundaries. How do we practically bring people out of poverty while also um, while not having economic growth? And then to the against side, how do we bring people out of poverty with economic growth, growth while not growing our current emissions in the global north? Thank you very much. So uh, the comparisons with Finland and Norway, not really relevant when you think about the populations of places like Asia and Africa. Who, you know, how do you end capitalism when those people want to consume, want the standards of living that perhaps we've enjoyed? The cost of renewables has gone down. Is this a political question about convincing people to withdraw subsidies or an economic question about overturning the system? And how do you bring down poverty without growth or equally, how do you save the, save the environment uh, at the expense of, uh, and yet actually allow people to, to move out of poverty? George, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I mean, it's interesting, you know, picking up the contrast between the U.S. and Finland, as you say, the U.S. far more powerful. I mean, overall, globally, capitalism is becoming more extreme, not less extreme. You know, we've moved away from the social democratic era of capitalism, the Keynesian version of capitalism, towards this extreme neoliberal market fundamentalist version of capitalism. And the reason for that is that capitalism generates its own momentum. People gain power under the system, and they play the system with the use of that power. Are we seeing any of the things we want to see happening? No, we're not. not nothing nowhere near the scale that we need to see them on. Because, to, to um, go to the second question, because of the sunk costs already invested by large capitalist enterprises, be it Exxon or BP or whoever it might be, they have got their investments which they are trying to protect, and they use political means like um, funding Donald Trump or Scott Morrison or Jair Bolsonaro in order to protect those investments. And they gain control over the system as a whole. So for years and years, all four of us on this panel, you know, and I applaud and salute Adair and Tony for all their efforts, we've been trying to fight this system from within. Are we winning? No. We are failing spectacularly because you cannot fight it from within because it generates its own power. This is why we need to be pressing, and this, this is a, an effort of global persuasion, to say we have to fight this from without by demanding and creating a new system.
Rehtsäne. Let me pick up the point about small and large population countries. In fact, uh, the greatest part of my focus this year is on the decarbonization of the Chinese economy. I'll be spending about six weeks in total uh, in China, probably not in the next couple of weeks. There's <laughs> been a, little, a little, <laughs> little delay in the launch of our next thing. And what we are trying to do there is to persuade China that it could be a zero carbon economy by 2050. Uh, Xi Jinping has a phrase, China 2050, a fully developed rich economy. And we have recently produced a report called China 2050, a fully developed rich zero carbon economy. Now, is China a capitalist or a socialist country, company, economy? It, it's called locally uh, an economy of socialism with Chinese characteristics. Um, <laughs> Some people think it would be better to be called a capitalist economy with Chinese characteristics. It's a funny mix, but it has a very dynamic private sector. The solar PV panels, the, uh, the, uh, the, the batteries, the EVs are all being developed by amazingly uh, dynamic uh, Chinese entrepreneurs, overlapping with a state sector, many of which are those state-owned companies, almost act as if they were private companies in the terms of the way they uh, look after the managers of those. So it's, it's a complicated thing to understand, but it is certainly a form of market economy with many of the aspects of capitalism to it. Still building coal-fired uh, And I have to say, station. if I turned up there, well, let me come back to that. If I turned up there and said, OK, guys, what you have to do is to reject capitalism, we'd get nowhere. Right? What happens in China is fundamental. Their emissions are now 10 gigatons of CO2, 12 gigatons, including the other greenhouse gases. Ours are uh, 450 and falling. Even on a per capita basis, they are going above UK and European levels. And to win the argument in China, there is only one way to do it, which is to convince them that it is technologically possible for them to be a proud, rich, developed society in which Chinese people enjoy the opportunities, okay. the economic opportunities that we enjoy, that it's technologically possible to do that and be a zero carbon economy. I'm and just that's, gonna... that's how you have to win it. And in order to deliver it, you also have to use powerful market economy techniques involving entrepreneurs competing with one another to drive down the cost of batteries, to drive down the cost of electrolysis equipment, to drive down the cost of solar PV. So I think when you look at that large population country, where, as I say, that is where most of my focus is uh, this year, I would say the idea that we have to uh, approach this issue by suggesting the rejection of capitalism uh, is just completely the wrong way to I'm go. I'm going to pause you there because Fahana wants to come in. Yeah, on the question of subsidies, so in 2009, the biggest, richest countries in the world, the G7, came together and agreed to phase out fossil fuel subsidies, 2009. Okay, so that's why I'm convinced that coming together and trying to get these agreements, which then are negated, is impossible in this system without something else happening. And that something else happening is, first of all, I think my opponents need to accept the failures of the system. Yeah. And that's why I'm here, to convince you, but also to convince them to have a little bit of a, a wake-up moment, a little bit of atonement, a little bit of a, yes, we failed because we did not recognize the magnitude of the political weight and the magnitude of the problems cannot be fixed with techno-managerial solutions. The second point I want to make is about populations. So many of the countries that you suggested, many of the continents that you suggested, have extremely low per capita emissions. It's not the size of the populations that matters, it's their consumption, whether they're doing it, uh, it within their own countries or offshoring it actually elsewhere. So China's emissions are mainly coming from us and consumption no, no, by us. No. A lot of that is coming. Ten percent of them are. You, you, can't, you can't say something which is just not true, Farhana. Okay. Ten so, percent of so them let are me coming finish. from ten. Let me finish. Well, that's ten percent is right. still okay. a large It's a lot. It's a lot, number. but it's not all. That's, it's not most. It's not most. It's not all, but, but it's the richest people <laughs> in, the, in this country that are responsible for the bulk of the UK's emissions. So the, you know, the bottom 75%, you know, the, remember the pyramid of extraction? 
They don't fly. They don't have cars. They don't have second homes. They don't have the kind of luxury okay. lifestyles. So I think we need to not keep looking at whether it's population that's the driver. And I think Tony's also, you know, very fixated on population as the driver of, you know, destruction. Right. It's actually this extractive system I'm which accumulates for the benefit of I a few. I want to get there's, there's a whole queue of people up there with questions. Tony, I'm going to give you a last chance just to go back to the questions, answer yeah. some of the points that have been so raised. So I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm in total agreement with this idea that we need to change the system. But there are two really important questions that you must answer when you say that. Number one is change the system to what? And then the second bit is, how do you change the system? And so we need a clear pathway between here and where we're going to go next. And if we're going to go somewhere where we're going to want to take 7.7 .7 billion people with us, we have to have an offer that is both realistic and attractive, and which has got some means of garnering political and democratic support for it. And so we have to be very clear. I have thought about this a fair bit, and I think that probably our best chance in the 10 years that we've got left is to adapt the existing system into something that can start to look like it's ecologically sustainable. If we just push it into uh, the uh, margins, what do we finish up with? We finish up with a lot of chaos. We finish up probably with unemployment. We finish up possibly with people not having energy or food, literally, because all of those things are presently delivered by capitalist organizations. And without a pathway between here and what we want to change to, okay. I think we're going to be wasting our time. Far better to advocate for changing the existing system. Let's change the hard caps in law. Let's change okay. the subsidy regime. Let's put a carbon Let tax in place. Let's give capitalism a purpose. And let's change the measure of GDP to something which is more about what society needs. Let's take some more questions. I'm going to go, just to say, the final vote's taking place. So hopefully you've all put your cards in. Um, and if you're still undecided, you put the whole card in if you're not there or there. I'm going to go up to the balcony and take three from up there. So go for it. And be brief, because we've not a lot of time. Tony's five-point plan seems precise and pragmatic. Please can Farhana and George respond in a meaningful, engaged way to those points and clarify to what extent that plan could achieve your stated uh, future goal. Thank you. I can actually agree that uh, Tony's plan sounds great, and I think both Tony and Adair have admitted that for capitalism to win this argument, capitalism needs to change. Yeah. The big challenge is, who's going to change it? Who's going to force that change? <laughs> I mean, who here trusts the politicians of this country to run a bath, never mind change politics? We, we, the capitalists themselves, these companies, the, the bare moths of capitalism, have known the science, not for 10 years, they've known for 50 years. And they've done nothing about it. They've actually counteracted what they need to do. So who is going to actually realistically make that change? That's what you need to convince us that we're going to come with you on this. Thank you. Um, so I'm a mum of three, and um, I think I'm going to ask a question that my kids would probably want to know the answer to, um, which is, so if, 70, if there's 100 companies that are responsible for 70% of CO2 emissions since the 1980s, um, the people at the top of these companies, why don't they care? Are they psychopaths? <laughs> um, and the, the governments that they, that they support, yeah. And secondly, um, I want to ask for, uh, for a gut feeling here from you guys, um, maybe a little bit of hope for me, please. Um, have we got this? Can we apply the brakes in time? Um, or are my kids who are eight, six, and four going to die prematurely in some kind of climate-related war over resources? Thank you. I'm going to start at this end of the table, just for a change. Adair Turner. Let me answer that final question. Um, Gramsci said you must be uh, pessimistic of the intellect, but optimistic of the will. You must carefully work out what your chances of success are with a bias to pessimism so that you are realistic, but then you must try and change those chances. I am 100% convinced that if there were a benign deity again above us, and if she sent angels in the night to steal all our fossil fuels by 2050, that we would by then build a zero-carbon economy 
and that we would hardly notice the cost of getting there on economic standards of living. I think there's about a 30% chance that we will do that. And I'm afraid my blunt belief is that the 70% chance we're probably going to fail. So my aim in life is to turn 30 to 31 to 32 to 33 in Europe, particularly in India and in China where I work. But in order to shift it from 31 to 32 to 33, I think turning up and saying that the thing to do is to reject capitalism rather than reform it is likely to reduce the probabilities that well, I will increase that from 31 to 32 to 33 rather than increase it. But that, I'm afraid, is my honest assessment of the odds as we face them at the moment. And what about the question about do those companies simply not care? I think it varies. I think uh, there are fossil fuel companies which now take the science very uh, seriously. Um, and I think there are others, and I'm not going to name which they are, uh, which really uh, don't uh, at all. I think uh, there isn't a, 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 a unified approach within the fossil fuel companies of the world. I think there's quite a spectrum <laughs> of different companies. points of view. <laughs> no, no, th look, they are fossil fuel companies, well, but we, some of them want to get out of fossil fuels time, and some so, don't. Some, okay. are, some of them are denying the science and others are not denying They're the science. They're jumping up and down on the side okay, of the table. Well, so, so let's take the ones who aren't denying the science, like Shell and BP. Shell won't even tell me what its investments are in renewables. They do not feature in its annual report because they are so tiny. Instead, it is trying to invest as much in fossil fuels this year as it invested last year and the year before and the year before. It's trying to maintain those investments because that's where the value of its capital mm -hmm. is. Thank you. We ask, why don't these people care? The people might care. The system does not care. They have a fiduciary duty towards the investors in that system to maximize the value of their investment. That is the central premise of capitalism. What Adair and Tony are trying to do is to take a system which, as I hope I demonstrated at the beginning, is innately unsustainable, innately drives us towards disaster and says, let's turn it around and make it sustainable. It is innately destined not to be. They are chasing unicorns. And I hope you haven't voted for them. <laughs> can I, can I Alana, very briefly, I want to get yeah, one so, more question. Um, no, absolutely. So you're, you're absolutely right that many of these companies yeah. knew, they've known for 40 years, and their strategy was to obfuscate, deny, and delay. Every month they delay is usually millions of pounds. That's why I told you about what Saudi Aramco does. Its strategy literally is second per second delay of okay. the inevitable, and they have huge power, these industries, to stop that. They are on trial. Lawyers are taking them, citizens are taking them to court. I hope, as a lawyer, those legal processes will deliver justice. I hope that opinions like this debate will show to those CEOs and everyone who's in touch with them that they are failing humanity and their legacy will be one of, you know, destruction. Okay. So that's what I'm saying, but I, I, I feel I want to that now Ecoside is what is happening. It I'll fits the facts. I want to take one more question from the floor, because as Fahana rightly pointed out to me, we only heard from one woman, so I'm going to go to the woman in the yellow jumper there. Wait for the microphone, it's just behind you. Very, very briefly, if you can. Hi, sorry, time. I only said that because you wanted a woman. Um, the que the question, I have to stand, sorry. Um, the, the question I have, I, I think, is, you know, China has had uh, a benevolent dictator for two and a half thousand years. He's the man you have to persuade. <laughs> President Xi has a control of such a vast potential, uh, you know, when they wanted to reduce their population, they introduced a, a one-child policy. They did it overnight. They can create change overnight, more or less. So President Xi is, is the man that you have to talk to, I think. So. There's an invitation, Adair Turner. Let me just get out my mobile phone. And, uh... <laughs> is it fair to put it all at the, uh, the foot of President Xi? This is a very middle-class conversation in some ways, isn't it, about us, just to bring it back here mm. in the UK. Is it fair for us to ask those countries over there to change their ways when we're not prepared to change ours, very briefly. Well, the answer is, in this country, I raise issues about people's lifestyle, 
right, about what I or other people have done in terms of their transport choices, their diet choices. I think that's legitimate here. I, I don't raise those issues in China because at the moment they have a GDP per capita about a third of us. So I don't think it's appropriate to raise those issues when they're still at that level. I think you're broadly right that China is not a complete, it's, it's actually got more decentralized power structures than you might think, and it has some big coal lobbies, which by the way are state-owned coal lobbies, preventing some of the move towards renewable energy, which is primarily driven by private entrepreneurs. That happens to be the way around in China. But we do have to try and influence the Chinese power structure. The good news is, there's, lot, there's lots of bad news about the Chinese power structure, but it is a technocratic, scientific structure that believes in experts. So when their scientific experts say climate change is for real, the Himalayan glaciers are going to melt, this is going to do terrible things to our river flows, they take it seriously. Okay. So one has to work with that and see whether one can get more aggressive targets for decarbonisation than those that are in place already. George or Fahana, who, who would like to answer? That's such an easy question. I'll leave it to Fahana. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think... You know, we're always waiting for the right leader to come along, and I feel that one of the mistakes of the past has, to, has been to, that we didn't involve people. We really didn't involve people. A lot of these technical plans, a lot of these solutions were never tested, on, you know, tested with people, and were they willing to accept that? So, yes, leaders matter. I'm not saying that Chinese leadership doesn't matter. But the leadership of people, the voice of people, matters even more. And that's why, for example, Extinction Rebellion has been very vociferous in demanding uh, citizens' assemblies and selections. And I would say, in response to the question about what are your alternatives, actually, you know, all of the executive boards, all of the decision-making structures should now have mandatory representation of every cohort and of population. So there are pragmatic ways in which we can fix governance without going to nationalization and ownership. This isn't about that. You can put uh, uh, you know, three, three young people who sit on all of the decisions. Uh, why not? You can have an ombudsperson uh, who looks after the rights of uh, citizens, uh, those who are excluded from, from voting, who are literally okay. not being uh, seen and heard in the current voting system. So there's lots of ways in which practically we can reform capitalism, but I think after that reform it doesn't look like capitalism and it won't result in all of the uh, egregious okay. degradation that we've been talking about. We're going to wrap up the questions there because, as ever, time is short. I think you've been taking part in the final vote. There's some furious counting going on somewhere. Uh, the motion, just a reminder, to stop climate collapse, we must end capitalism. We're going to hear final summing up speeches from our panel. Tony Juniper, if I can ask you to go first. Well, what I've heard this evening uh, is not only a discussion about economics, it's also been very much a discussion about politics and where power lies. And if we are going to be able to change our system in time to avoid climate collapse and ecological catastrophe, we're going to have to find ways of getting enough power behind the kinds of alternatives that we think will work. The question was in the room this evening, uh, who will change it? Who is going to put in place the kinds of shifts that we need? Well, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the good news is that it's all of us, uh, through being voters, through being activists, through being conveyors of ideas, the fantastic work that George and Farhana have done over the years to raise awareness, to put inspiring ideas into the public space, and then to demand action, this is essential. But at the same time as having increased citizen participation, we have to have an idea of where we're going and what we're going to do. We have 10 years remaining. That's what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tell us. Never mind the catastrophe that's unfolding in the tropical rainforests and the coral reefs from parallel pressures being exerted on those places. If we're going to be able to make the most of this small window of opportunity that remains, we have to work in the real world. It's all very well condemning capitalism and saying it doesn't work. We all agree with its downsides. What we have to have is a workable alternative that will get the backing of voters. It's great that China's got a more or less benevolent dictator, but I really shudder to think at the idea of advocating dictatorship as a solution to this. There's some very bad experiences okay. globally throughout the world as a result of that particular style of sorting problems out. 
We have to educate citizens. Briefly. We have to inspire them. We have to get them to back the kinds of policies that we know can work. And those policies are embedded in the existing system that needs to change fundamentally. But changing it is going to work better than chucking it out. Sahana, over to you. So, so I, think, I think there's so much agreement that the solutions are there and that a lot of it is about political will. But I think the new system looks something like this. I think land is massively taxed. Okay, land isn't taxed at the moment. What you do on it is taxed. So land comes back into some kind of communally held concept. And I think British law, English law, uh, common law has many, many brilliant ways in which we can do that. Many of you um, live in flats where you have a lease and there's a freehold. So we can construct many different ways in which we can all co-own things and it's not all state-owned or uh, owned for private profit. We can put uh, uh, young people, we can put uh, lay people on all of the decision-making boards that there are in all forms of government. I live in Camden, we've already had a citizens' assembly. We're now experimenting with what we call a think-and-do pop-up space where the community comes and collaborates. They co-design and collaborate, that's what we're testing. So it's far from a dictatorship, it's far from this rather nasty model that you're you know, putting forward, which is, I think, you know, we're still trapped in the mentality that we're all going to go, if we, if we, if we uh, you know, denounce um, capitalism, that, you know, we're, we're pro-Stalin or something. That's pretty much what people seem to think, and that's really not, not the case. And we have a positive vision, and that vision already exists, and it's called the Sustainable Development Goals, and it's been adopted by every single country, and it consists of an inter interrelated 17 goals which all of society, every human being, means that they're not left behind from prosperity, and it means that there's no competition, no fake competition between people and nature, between people in one country or another. We're working collaboratively together. All of that's been agreed. The green economy is, by and large, already, or, already here. Actually, it generates more jobs, and you're not seeing it, you're not hearing about it, because they don't have the lobbying power to okay. influence uh, uh, and pay for the kind of sophisticated ads for billions that you see from the fossil fuel industry, which is, you know, faking it and doing greenwashing whilst doing business as usual. So lots and lots of things to look forward to and nothing to lose from, you know, stepping back from the edge. Thank you. Adair Turner. I think George posed the fundamental question. Is there something structural in the very definition of capitalism so that it is bound to be environmentally destructive? And I think Tony put the argument very effectively against because he set out a five-point plan of believable things that you could do, which if you put them in place, would have a capitalist economy which would be environmentally sound. A capitalist economy in the only meaningful sense of a capitalist economy, which is that most firms would be privately owned, that our restaurants would be privately owned, our hotel companies privately owned, our car manufacturers, our battery manufacturers, our solar food manufacturers would be privately owned. Now, in order to get anything like Tony's program, we have to reform capitalism absolutely <coughs> fundamentally. And I absolutely agree with Fahana and George that one of the problems is that the very process of capitalism produces concentrations of wealth that can have a political influence on policies which are perverse. So we have got to win the argument against that. But I think we are far more likely to win the argument against that if we are arguing for a reformed, regulated, and controlled capitalism rather than suggesting that we should reject capitalism in favor of some other model, which we're not really allowed to know what it is, because I don't think you are clear what it is. Well, because you it. We're not imposing it. Hang on, you you let him finish, you. let the man finish. Well, I, I, that is a bit of an article of faith for us to accept <laughs> that we'll, just, we'll find this thing which we don't know what it is. And, and I would put it down. If at the end of the day, Briefly. you're not saying that you want to nationalized restaurants and hotels and battery companies and car companies and electrolysis companies, then you are accepting capitalism in any reasonable right. sense no. of the word capitalism. George Monbiot. <laughs> 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 
Now, despite being our opponents, these are good people, you know, <laughs> who have spent... <laughs> and the same. <laughs> who, <laughs> yeah, who I greatly admire, and it's a pleasure to debate with them. But the, the question they have repeatedly failed to answer is, why haven't we won yet? Everything I've been hearing them say, I've been hearing them and people like them and people like us say, for my entire working life, 35 years, we're all in the second bloom of youth from this panel, <laughs> Tony's five-point plan, marvellous, brilliant, fantastic. I've seen it for 35 years, people putting this stuff forward. Why haven't we won yet? And the reason we haven't won yet is we're up against a system which is innately unreformable because of its intrinsic characteristics. We would love to reform it. We would love to have everyone coming out, all the capitalists coming out of their boardroom singing Kumbaya. It is not going to happen. <laughs> it is not how capitalism works. Capitalism is a system for accumulation. It accumulates profit, it accumulates power, it accumulates natural wealth at other people's expense, and we are seeing the results of that now. Why, despite all these marvellous things we've been hearing, are we not pulling back from catastrophe, but accelerating towards it? It's because this is not a system that can be reformed from within. This is a system that must be overthrown and changed. This is a system whose days, I sincerely hope, are numbered. Thank you. Golly, we could go on for some time. This is fabulous. So I have in my hand a piece of paper, which is the final vote on the motion to stop climate collapse. We must end capitalism. Now, before the debate, 38% of you were in favour of the motion, 28% were against, and 34% were undecided. But now, 35% of you are for the debate, 58% are against, and 7% of you still don't know what you think. We tried. Told you. We did. <laughs> See, they're really lovely. <laughs> Thank you very much to this fantastic panel. Well done. George, Bahana, Adair, Tony, thank you all very much.